As I've said, the topic this evening is, um, I wouldn't say that it's difficult, you know, to understand, but there's a lot of parts to it, so it might be a little bit complex to kind of keep it all in our minds at the same time. Okay, so let's, let's first of all look at perhaps how this, how it came to be, okay, how did open theism uh, develop, and it really developed in, in the, argue, the ongoing debate, the arguments that exist between Arminianism and, and Calvinism, okay, over the matter of God's sovereignty, particularly with regard to our salvation. Now, I, I'm just going to give a little bit of background here, hopefully it doesn't confuse us, just, just to remind us what Arminians believe uh, regarding the sovereignty of God, regarding the knowledge of God. Um, Arminians and Calvinists, okay? So, first of all, with regard to his sovereignty. Now, both Arminians and, Cal and Calvinists believe that God is sovereign, okay? But Arminians want to say that his sovereignty does not extend to our salvation. Now, this is going to be really key, and that's the reason I, I bring this up. They believe, Arminians believe, that God has left the ultimate choice of whether we're going to be saved or not up to us. They believe that sin has not affected our whole being, okay? We're not totally depraved, okay? Even after the fall, we still have enough of God's moral image, enough desire for good to choose what is good. So that if Christ is presented to us in the gospel, we can receive him if that's what we want to do. Okay, we have the power of contrary choice. We can choose, choose him or choose not to have him entirely apart from God's grace. We have that ability left over from the fall. Now, Calvinists, on the other hand, as you well know, <laughs> believe that because of Adam's sin, we were born with nothing of God's moral image. We have no desire for the good, and so we have no ability to choose good or to choose Christ. We cannot receive Christ as he is offered to us in the gospel unless and until God gives us that ability through his gracious gift of the new birth, which he sovereignly gives only to those whom he has chosen. So this is the first point, okay, when we're talking about God's sovereignty. Arminians believe that we have the freedom to choose, that anyone can receive Christ without God's grace, okay, without any additional grace on his part, any interaction, any intervention on his part. Calvinists believe that no one can unless he gives grace. Okay, that's the first point. Secondly, both also believe that God is omniscient, okay, that he has unlimited, infinite knowledge Okay, both Calvinists and Arminians, that he knows the choices that we're going to make ultimately, okay, um, whether we're going to receive him or not, actually all decisions, all choices, but they differ as to how God actually arrives at that knowledge. Okay, Arminians believe that God knows our choices because he looks forward into the future and he sees the choices that we'll freely make uh, according to our inclinations, according to the ability that we all have. That's how he knows. He looks ahead. He sees all things. Calvinists, on the other hand, believe that he knows our choices because he's planned our choices. Now, that sounds kind of, uh, uh, sounds a little bit like determinism, but, but it isn't because God never forces us to choose anything against our will. We are free to choose what we want at all times. But again, um, we know that coming into this world, we're, we're affected by the fall, and so we'll only choose what is evil unless the Lord changes our hearts and gives us his Holy Spirit, and then we will choose him. Now, we need to ask the question, why is it that Arminians hold to the position they do with regard to our freedom, our ability, uh, to choose Christ or not. Well, they hold that view because they believe that's what the Bible teaches. You know, they think the Bible teaches that we're not utterly fallen, that we still have enough ability to choose Christ. 
but also because um, they believe that God wants us to have the choice of whether or not we will be saved, that he wants us to have the last decision, okay, the last word on the matter. And you've heard, you've heard, you know, the, I don't know, what do you, what do you call it? Um, uh, it's not an analogy, but uh, maybe a, a saying that um, God votes for you, the devil votes against you, and you cast the deciding vote. Well, you see, they, they believe we have the final say. However, they also believe, okay, and this is where it gets a little bit tough, so this is where I want you to kind of knuckle down and try to, try to get a hold of this. We maybe have never met an Arminian as sophisticated as this, but, but apparently this is their belief that for us to have the kind of freedom that God wants us to have, the freedom to choose Him, we have to be absolutely free in our choices. In other words, there cannot be any influence in our choices. I know it sounds strange, okay, but, but this is their position. So nothing in the past, nothing in the present, nothing in the future, and I'll, we'll look at that just a little bit more in a moment. Our choices must be absolutely undetermined and spontaneous. We have to be able to be free to make that choice at the moment, uncoerced, okay? Now, Jonathan Edwards critiqued that view in his book, The Freedom of the Will, pointing out, again, as the theologian of causality, that there is no such thing as an uncaused choice. There are always reasons why we choose the things that we choose. Every choice that we make is influenced by, by our whole life experience, right? By our past, our upbringing, and our education by our presence, our current state of mind and heart, uh, the future incentives that are presented to influence us to go one direction or another. There is always a reason why we choose what we choose, okay? But they go a step further, okay? Arminianism further teaches that for our choices to be absolutely free, that there always has to be the equal possibility that we may choose or not choose something. In other words, when Christ is presented to us, there has to be an equal possibility that we choose him or don't choose him. That choice cannot be certain, okay? Because if it's certain, then we don't actually have freedom. Now, that may be a little bit difficult if that's the first time you've been exposed to that idea, but the idea is, again, certainty seems to rule out freedom. Now, Jonathan Edwards also answered that objection. He pointed out this, that if God knows what that choice is going to be, which he does, even on their principles, and he was the first one to point that out, because remember, they think he looks forward and, and he sees what we're going to do, then that choice that we make is absolutely certain. God can't look forward and see something and know it's going to happen if it isn't certain that it's going to take place, right? Because if it wasn't going to take place, God would know that it's not going to take place. If there was some question, then God wouldn't know whether it was going to take place or not. But if he knows it's going to take place, then it's absolutely certain that it's going to take place. And that certainty means that ultimately we are not free. Now, that's the argument that Edwards used against the Arminians, trying to point out that, as a matter of fact, our choices are certain. But they denied that, and they said, no, it may be ultimately that's going to happen, but they're not certain. But he says, well, if God knows them, they have to be certain. Well, it just so happens that that argument continued to work in the minds of, of the Arminian, and they finally, some of them at least, uh, came to the conclusion that he's right. If God knows it, then it must be certain. And if it's certain, then it cannot be free. And so that is really what, what is the cause, or out, this, out of this is, what, is why open theism developed. By the way, another name for open theism is hyper-Arminianism, hyper-Arminianism. If God's knowledge of the future means that our choices are certain, and that certainty takes away our freedom of choice, then God must not know the future. 
God must not know what our choices are. You see, freedom has to be preserved at any cost. A philosopher and pastor by the name of James Rissler, writing in, in an article entitled Open Theism, says this, the most important philosophical argument for open theism is based on the idea that God's foreknowledge of one's actions is incompatible with those actions being free. Okay, you see that. I hope you see how that, how that uh, he's saying exactly the same thing, but just simply stating it clearly. The most important philosophical argument for open theism is based on the idea that God's foreknowledge of one's actions is incompatible with those actions being free. Now, R.C. Sproul also tells us this with regard to open theism. He says, in their view, God is limited in his knowledge. He doesn't have full omniscience because he doesn't know the future decisions of humans. Not only does he not know, he can't know. Now, there seems to be a little bit of discrepancy there because... Um, Rissler points out that that, that it may not necessarily be that God can't know, but that he chooses not to know. He chooses to be ignorant of the choices that men make because he wants them to be free. He wants them to be free to love him without any coercion. You know, I mean, think about our own relationships. You know, we don't want you know, our children to be forced to love us we want them to love us, you know, because we give them reasons to love us. And what they're saying is that God is the same way. He doesn't want to force anyone to love him. He just he wants everyone to have the choice to freely do that. So this is what Rissler writes again about open theism. He says, open theism is the thesis that because God loves us and desires that we freely choose to reciprocate his love, he has made his knowledge of and plans for the future conditional upon our actions. Okay, he's already told us that God doesn't know the actions, the free actions of men. He's limited in that knowledge uh, because that's incompatible with our freedom. And God wants us to be free, free to love him. And that's why he chooses not to know what our choices are going to be, what our actions are going to be. Now, these people that I've quoted are in the church. You know, I think, um, let's see, Rissler, what was he? Um, I forget now the, um, it, it, it's a Christian denomination, but I forget. Obviously, R.C. is Reformed. Um, I'm not sure if Rissler actually adopts open theism or he's simply um, explaining it. But there are people in the church that do hold to this position. As a matter of fact, the reason why we're talking about it tonight is because the name of one of them was brought up last week, and he's one of the leading proponents, at least he was during his lifetime, and that's Clark Pinnock. But those who are in the church seek to justify this view that God doesn't know what men are going to decide, and, and so when he finds out what they're going to do, then he reacts to it. They point to Scripture, to the, uh, to the Lord's apparent changes of mind, okay, that they find in Scripture, that he changes his mind on certain occasions. The fact that he does that means that he must not have known what was going to take place until the choice was actually made, and then God responded to that choice. Now, John Frame, who is a former professor of systematic theology and, and philosophy, both at Westminster Seminary down in Southern California and RTS in Orlando, Florida, wrote a book on this called No Other God, a response to open theism. He writes this, and, and here's where he explains that position. Open theists such as Clark Pinnock, John Sanders, Gregory Boyd, and William Hasker seek to do justice to the give and take in Scripture between God and human beings. For example, in Exodus 32, verses 7 through 10, God tells Moses he will destroy Israel for worshiping the golden calf and raise up a new nation from Moses himself. Moses intercedes, however, and in verse 14, God relents. God also seems to change his mind in Isaiah 38, verses 1 through 5, where Isaiah prophesies that King Hezekiah will die. But in response to Hezekiah's repentance, adds 15 years to his life. 
And in Jonah, chapters 3 through 4, where God retracts an announcement of judgment in response to Nineveh's repentance. From these and other such passages, the open theists infer that God is a temporal being, not above time as in much traditional theology, that he changes his mind, that his plans are influenced by creatures, that he sometimes regrets actions that he has performed, as in Genesis 6, 6, and that he does not have exhaustive knowledge of the future. On their view, God's regretting and relenting come about because human free decisions are utterly undetermined and unpredictable. So God must adjust his plans to the free choices of human beings. Okay, so let me just summarize where we're at with regard to open theism, okay? Open theism teaches that God has given us the freedom to choose because he wants us to love him freely. We have the power of contrary choice. But for our choices to be free, he cannot know what we're going to choose, okay? He cannot foreknow our choices. And the Bible seems to indicate that God doesn't know what we're going to choose. If he did, he would never have to change his mind in response to our choices. Okay, so that's what they're saying. Okay, that's what they're saying is the truth regarding God and regarding the way he works. But if we're going to refute this, we need to be able to answer their arguments. Okay, so we need to prove three things. First of all, that we don't have the ability, we don't have the power of contrary choice to choose God apart from his grace. Okay, we don't have the power to choose good or evil as we come into this world apart from his grace. Secondly, we need to prove that God does in fact know all things, foreknow all things, even our choices, because he has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. And thirdly, that though God may appear to change his mind on occasion, He's really actually doing what he has planned to do. Okay, there is no ultimate change of mind. Okay. So let's consider first that we don't have the power to choose God apart from his grace. We don't have the power of contrary choice. Now, we don't need to spend much time on this because we recently did, you know, looked at this in that sermon, Is My Neighbor Really That Bad? Okay. We read in Romans 3.10, There is none righteous, not even one. Okay. There is no one who does what's right. There are no exceptions. Remember, Adam's fall brought about the withdrawal of the Holy Spirit from all of his children so that we all come into this world hating God. We all come into this world averse from God. We will not come to God, as Jesus said about uh, his own ministry during his lifetime. You know, the light has come into the world. This is the judgment. Light has come into the world. But darkness hates the light and won't come to the light, lest their evil deeds be reproved. So those who are evil will not come to Christ. And as a matter of fact, we all are evil. David writes in Psalm 51, verse 5, what is true of all of us? Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. And let's not forget what Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. And... Uh, you know, he, he says, first of all, to the Ephesians, this is true of you, but then he says it was true of all of us, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now, we were dead because we didn't have the Spirit. We had nothing of the Spirit. We weren't just mortally wounded. We weren't just barely alive, but with enough ability to trust Jesus if he's presented to us. We were dead because void of the Spirit, unable to come to him. He says we, we lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulged the desires of the flesh and of the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, came into the world under God's judgment. That was our condition apart from God's grace. But then he goes on to say, but God, when we were dead, made us alive. And that's, that's his mercy. But before that, this is our condition. And that's why Jesus said, 
in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. The Father must draw or no one will come. And the way he draws is by his Holy Spirit, giving us his Holy Spirit. Jesus says in John 6, 63, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Without God's Spirit, the way we come into the world, we will never come. So think of it in these terms. If the open theists were right, that, that God wants us to love him freely, okay, apart from any intervention on his part, okay? Well, if he were to do that, if he were to say, this is the way I want it to be, according to the way we come into the world, none of us would want him. And we would all perish because we would choose not to love him. We actually hate him. So that, that plan's not going to work, okay? So open theists may think that's what God wants, but um, and as a matter of fact, that isn't the case. God knows we can't love him. That's why he has to intervene. Now, secondly, God does, in fact, foreknow all things, even our choices, based upon the fact that he foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 1 verse 11, also, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. All things, okay? So this inheritance is the eternal inheritance that we receive through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason why we obtain it is because we were predestined, predetermined, chosen by God to trust in his Son. This was according to his purpose, his sovereign plan that includes all things, who works all things after the counsel of his will. And notice, not just some things, but all things. God's plan is absolutely comprehensive, and he works all things according to his plan. And that's the reason why he knows all things, okay? Now, Frame tells us that... Um, that, that God is, again, working all things and, and he knows all things um, in every area. So let me give you a few examples that he gives. God controls, for instance, the processes of nature. God's involved in that. David writes, you visit the earth and cause it to overflow. You greatly enrich it. The stream of God is full of water. You prepare their grain. For thus you prepare the earth, you water its furrows abundantly, you settle its ridges, you soften it with showers, you bless its growth, you have crowned the year with your bounty, and your paths drip with fatness. God is in absolute sovereign control of nature. He would say, even the smallest details in nature, remember what Jesus says in Matthew 10, verses 29 and 30, are not two sparrows sold for a cent, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. He seemed, well, he controls, uh, Frame would go on to say, seemingly random events. Remember what Solomon writes in Proverbs 16, verse 33, the lot is cast into the lamp, it, excuse me, in the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So even, you know, uh, rolling the, the lots and, and throwing them However they fall out, that's what God has determined. He's in control of that. He governs human history. Paul said to the Areopagites in, in Acts 17, verse 26, He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. God governs all the nations. He even governs the decisions that we make. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost regarding Judas. You have to pay close attention to this in Acts 2, 23. This man, Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, how was he handed over? How was he uh, delivered over to them? By Judas. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. It was God's plan that Judas would hand him over, as we know Jesus said that on several occasions. You know, have I not chosen you, the twelve, but one of you is a devil, and I will be betrayed by one of you. God hardened Pharaoh's heart to affect his choice. 
So he would not let God's people go. Exodus 4, verse 21. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Now, that's not the only person that he interacted with in that way. He hardens other people as well. We read in 1 Samuel 2, verse 25, they, that is the sons of Eli, would not listen to the voice of their father, for the Lord desired to put them to death. In other words, he hardened their hearts. Now, again, we know he does that by withdrawing his restraint. He doesn't inject evil into their hearts. He uses the evil that's there. But he, that's still his interaction influenced their choice. Paul writes in Romans 9, verse 18, So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. Is God completely uninvolved in the choices we make? No. So Frame concludes this. So human freedom is not indeterminate, as open theists maintain. We are free in that we do what we want to do but behind our plans and desires are those of God. And he gives one more example, James 4, verses 13 through 15. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. God is in control of the things we do. Now, God knows all things, as I said before, because he has planned all things. He works all things after the counsel of his will. And let me just remind you again of our meditation this evening. He says through Isaiah, remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So again, the second proposition of the open theist that God doesn't foreknow the actions of the decisions of men. He doesn't know what they're going to decide. That's why he can't decide what he's going to do until they decide what they're going to do. That is not what we get in Scripture. We see God is absolutely sovereign over everything that happens, even over the actions of men, even over our actions. So then finally, the, the question of does God change his mind, because that's really what they're using to prove this point. Though God may appear to do that, at, at times we have to realize that even this change of mind, so to speak, is a part of his plan. You know? If God knows all things, because he's planned all things, and he works all things after the counsel of his will, then can God really change his mind? Okay? Now, for instance, did he know that he would threaten to destroy Israel because they would commit the sin of the golden calf? Did he know that? Was that a part of his plan? Yes. But did he also know that he would relent when Moses interceded? Well, yes, he knew that because he was the one who gave them Moses as an intercessor so that he would intercede so that God wouldn't destroy them. That was a part of his plan, okay? It wasn't a change of mind on his part. Now, we might, we might say this, if Israel hadn't repented, would God have destroyed them? Yes, okay? But God planned to have Moses intercede and to listen to Moses, and he knew that he would, and he knew he wasn't going to destroy Israel. There's no contradiction there. And the same thing is true with regard to Hezekiah. Did God know that Hezekiah would get sick? Well, yes, it was a part of his plan. Perhaps he was chastising Hezekiah for some sin. Did he know that Hezekiah would pray and repent and ask for the Lord's mercy? Yes, he knew that. And did he know that he would extend his life another 15 years? Yes. God knew that. God actually planned that Hezekiah would pray so that his life would be extended. And we know that God would have destroyed the Ninevites if they hadn't repented 
But he also planned to send Jonah to preach. And remember, he had to actually course. <laughs> you know, Jonah made a decision not to do what God told him to do. And then God reversed that decision by coercing him. You know, when he got thrown overboard, he was in the belly of a fish or, a, you know, the, the, the sea beast for um, three days. I can't imagine what that was like. But he changed his mind and coerced him to go. And um, he, you know, Jonah knew that if he preached, God might be merciful. And God knew that the Ninevites would repent when they heard him so that they wouldn't be destroyed. Nothing caught God, you know, by surprise. He knew that. So God doesn't change his mind in response to what God does. He simply carries out what he's planned to do in the first place, knowing what's going to happen. You know, it's interesting that open theists would agree that God knows what will happen under any given set of circumstances. It's, although that, how can he even say that? He knows what would happen, let's say, under any given set of circumstances, but he just doesn't know what those circumstances are going to be. That's why he can't know what's going to happen. But let me just close with this, because this was really the last point. Does God change his mind? You know, but let's, let's go back to that second point again, because think about this. And this is an argument from reason. Okay? If God is infinite, he must be infinite in every way, because if he isn't, if he's limited in any way, then he can't be infinite at all. But the Bible says that he is infinite. God declares himself to be infinite, so he must be infinite in every way, which means that he must have infinite knowledge, even knowledge of what people are going to choose. And again, that's what the open theist is trying to avoid, is the idea that God foreknows the choice, because if he foreknows it, they can't be free. And if they can't be free, then they can't freely love him. But again, remember how things really are. Nobody would love him unless God sovereignly chose to change their direction by giving them his Holy Spirit. And he, in fact, does that uh, by choosing them from all eternity. Well, may the Lord uh, help us to um, at least understand a little bit more about open theism. <laughs> Uh, and maybe how to, um, how to address it. Well, let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer.